What is autism? What do we know about autism? Human beings exist on a spectrum of uh, how social we can be. And this is pretty interesting, actually, scientifically, uh, but also very important uh, clinically. There are hypersocial states where people are uh, almost too social. There are, are chromosomal deletion states where people have instant uh, affinity and bonding and, and rich, deep uh, seeming connections with people, very verbal. On the other end, people uh, with autism spectrum uh, disorder are uh, not able to keep up with social interactions. And it's a, it's a spectrum. Some have mild, mild to moderate difficulties. They may have uh, inability to understand what the next thing to do in a social situation is, but may have perfectly good language abilities. And as you progress further along the spectrum, that gets more and more severe. So they uh, can't make eye contact because it's too overwhelming to think about what has to be done next if a person looks in a particular way. Yeah. And then as you go farther, then language uh, and social communication themselves break down. So there's no reciprocity. There's no shared enjoyment. And that this gets very hard then as you get to this far end of the spectrum where there's really an absence of, of social cognition at all uh, and, and, and social bonding. So why why does this exist? What is it? Uh, it's very genetic. As I mentioned, it's, it's one of the, you know, top three or four most biological in the sense of most genetically determined of the psychiatric illnesses. It does have these interesting positive correlations, slight positive correlations with intelligence and education. And the reason for that is kind of interesting to think about. Is there something good about it? Just like, or at least with at least part of the spectrum, is there something good about it? Just as we were talking about for depression, as you could say for mania, as you could say for schizophrenia. And here it's kind of interesting to, to think about the, the underlying science of what it means to be good at a social interaction. The, yeah. Someone who's very good at a social interaction is incredibly good at dealing with unpredictable information, mm -hmm. is able to handle this torrent of information coming through, rapidly changing uh, model of the other person and of the interaction and their model of you, your model of them. With each word that changes, with each new bit of information that comes in through the conversation, each bit of body language, all this is rapidly changing. And some people are able to keep up with that fire hose information perfectly well. But that's a special brain state to be in. That's working with unpredictability. That's the, uh, the only way that can be done is most likely by constantly you know, running models of what the other person might be about to say. So you, don't, you can't stop and think, oh, what did that word mean? What did that shift in eye contact mean? You know, what do they mean together? There has to be some advanced work going on where you're predicting what's going on if you're to keep up with a, a rich and fast social interaction. Now, on the flip side, there are brain states that maybe don't have to work so fast, but that are extremely important still. Dealing with something that's not moving or that's predictable, still complex, like uh, you know, mathematical proof or a very complex arrangement of uh, geometrical shapes, uh, a large number of individual non-moving things. There's a possibly a, a way of being that's particularly good at dealing with these static, unmoving, or predictable situations, and less so with these rapidly changing social situations. And so the way I conceptualize autism is these are people who whose brains are not so good with the high bit rate, unpredictable information, but may be quite good at, given enough time, given the, uh, the grace to work with the system, uh, to look at it from different angles, uh, to take different perspectives with a confidence that it's not changing in between perspectives. Uh, that's a brain state that's valuable. It's something that has probably has contributed to a lot of the success of the human family, being able to design something, being able to consider the, the, all the different contributions to a static, predictable uh, system. So autism, in a sense, is a, is a spectrum that has, 
identifiable characteristics about the way people deal with uh, dynamic information often express itself as like social That's right. dynamic information. But you critically, your use of the word often there is really, I think, smart because it's not just social interaction that is a challenge in autism. And so many people conceptualize it purely as a social uh, dysfunction uh, uh, disorder. But it's really any unpredictable information that's a, a problem, that's a challenge for, for people on the spectrum. They react very uh, negatively to unexpected sounds, even if not social sounds, unexpected lights, unexpected touches. And so it's really unpredictable information that is, uh, in my view, the core problem with, with uh, the processing in, in autism, not just social. Social just shows up because it's so unpredictable. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, um, I try to not to think about that stuff. Um, I'm afraid of thinking disor about disorders and things like that because just like I don't like sort of economics or game theory, uh, I want to be careful with it because it, uh, whenever you have a category or a model, it's too easy to just, uh, for everything, I mean, it's the OCD thing. I like models too much. I like categories too much. The moment you acknowledge to yourself, well, I have an eating disorder, for example, or something like that, as opposed to just being a, well, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that for my own critical understanding of myself. Uh, let's just say I don't know how to moderate eating fruit. People make fun mm. of me. They think all fruit is fruit is healthy. Mm. I no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, I don't know how to moderate anything, but even even fruit. Uh, this uh, apples and cherries is, is, a, is a nightmare. Interesting. Anyway, <laughs> that's such a psychiatrist thing to say. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, but there's characteristics, and, and I, it's, it's interesting to think about, like for example, I have trouble making eye contact. But I actually, as you said it now, it's not that I'm shy at all in that sense. Right. I, it's literally, I'm getting way too much information and it's distracting me. Like I need to just close my eyes so I can, uh, like all the things that people seem to be able to do in parallel, it's just, you just asked me a question. For me to think about the answer to that question, I can't have all this cool, rich visual information coming my way. Yep. That's literally, because yep. I often close my eyes to think. It's not because I'm afraid of something, whatever. It's just like too much information happening here. Yeah. Well, that's a, a beautiful description. It's it's amazing that that is how you experience the, the eye contact uh, aspect. I think that's, I mean, you've, you've articulated what, uh, you know, captures it for, for so many people, which is that it's overwhelming. There's just, just too much information just coming in through the eyes. And to keep up with it, to know you're going to be expected to keep up with it, first of all. So there's that, that aspect. You know, you learned socially that there's going to be an expectation if you're making eye contact. People are going to think you're keeping up with it and... You don't want to because you want to focus on other things and make progress in other, you know, dimensions. Yeah, and so that then there's a strong desire to look away or to close the eyes because it's it's it's, it's overwhelming. It's a distraction and it's going to cause errors of of understanding. And of trust. course, our eyes—that's part the way we use our eyes is part of the human communication. So you have to kind of be aware of that of that um, that element of it. So yeah, I mean, but it's fascinating. You should be aware of your own self in those those little characteristics, whether it's uh, whether it's classified on some aspect of the uh, autism spectrum or just in general, yeah. whether it's eating, whether it's depression, whether it's uh, even like schizophrenia that would, I hope we get a chance to talk to a, a, a little bit. Yeah, the, but there, it, those things are all made up of different characteristics symptoms and characteristics and use use them as a superpower i i suppose is is the best we can hope for yep. in mild cases i guess now, i do think both brain states can't coexist at the same time the way of dealing with something unpredictable and dealing with something predictable there those are different ways of being here's a huge opportunity for very creative model building in theoretical neuroscience and linking that to these data streams we're getting across the brain that we talked about earlier, this, these immense data sets of activity across the brain. 
here's where I think there could be a real convergence of theoreticians and experimentalists to say, okay, given what we know about wiring of the brain, here is what the brain state is likely to be that deals well with unpredictable information. And here's the brain state that deals with predictable information. Here's why they're incompatible, at least at the same time. Here's why you've got to be able to detect which state you should be in. Here's how you could switch between them. Here's the kind of cells that you would predict, almost like predicting the, the Higgs boson. Here's the kind of circuitry that I would predict should govern the switching or might make one state too sticky, too hard to get out of, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. That is a huge opportunity for an interaction from the theoretical and experimental side together. Make one state too sticky. The <laughs> sort of uh, measure the stickiness of the state and how to lessen the stickiness. That's right. Get some oil in the machine. <laughs> yes, yeah, what would predict the kind of oil that would work well. Uh, what in your practice is um, treatment or advice for the people on the uh, autism spectrum? Yeah. So right now there's no real medical treatment. Uh, there are behavioral treatments that are most effective early in life. Uh, they make sure people don't fall too far behind. If you're not interacting socially, you create this you know, vicious cycle where you fall farther and farther behind because you're not interacting. And these, these therapies which are applied early in life, therapists work with the kids, train them to deal with these things that otherwise would be aversive to them, teach them how to predict things and interact, and that has a big effect, but it's behavioral therapy. There's no medicine that works. There are ways of reducing individual symptoms, though, that sometimes come along with autism, and those do respond to medications. So you can, you know, one thing, very often my patients with autism are very anxious because <laughs> They live in a world that they have a really hard time predicting what's going to happen. And so they find, and some of these are high-functioning, you know, Silicon Valley types who, you know, they may make, you know, great livings, but they're very unhappy because they're on the spectrum. They don't understand how social interactions really work. They're very uh, anxiety-provoking because they don't know what to say. They don't have any clue how anybody else knows what to say. They're constantly worried they're gonna say something that's completely inappropriate, and so they're very anxious. And I can I can treat their anxiety. It doesn't touch the autism per se, but I can help them with their anxiety. Yeah. What I just talked about, eye contact. I am richly, even with the eyes closed and all those kinds of things, I'm richly experiencing the world. And it's not like you're afraid of the world or you're not able, I don't know what to do. No, I know everything. In fact, I know way too much. There's so many cool options. Yeah. Like at any one moment, there's all the stuff happening and it's all beautiful. And at any one moment, you can do anything you want. You can take off your clothes. You can punch that guy over there. You can uh, run away. You can go in for a hug, you can say something profound and deep, or you can say something generic, or you mm -hmm. could use so many things you yeah, can say. Right, right. And then <laughs> and then it'll go, it'll unravel in all these kinds of ways, and this moment could be completely life-changing, yep. or it can be mundane and meaningless. And all of those options are before you at any one moment. <laughs> and so Isn't it's amazing? like, <laughs> it, it's amazing and overwhelming if you allow yourself to think about it, yes. which uh, like what, whatever, exactly. <laughs> like, well, unfortunately with chess, you have a few set options. Yes. Two-dimensional, at least. Two-dimensional, there's constraints. Yeah, yeah. There is yeah. unlimited possibilities and unlimited beautiful things happening all around you. So I don't think there's a kind of sense that somehow you're limited in your, in the, in the places of, uh, in the way you can see the world and how you can interact with that world. I am overwhelmed by the lack of limit <laughs> that all of us should be, have you looked around, you can do whatever the hell you want. Nobody will remember you anyway. Mo all of us will be dead one day. You could do anything. You can, uh, yeah. I don't know. You can get naked and run around the city as long as you're not hurting anybody and it doesn't matter. <laughs> So in Austin, anyway. Austin, yeah. <laughs> Back to, exactly. Seems like uh, a to-do item for anybody living in Austin, for sure. Yeah. But you know, the 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 spectrum is an interesting concept because that is, you know, when I say when I refer to the spectrum, 
Uh, I'm actually referring to it. It's a precise clinical term, but you're right, it's been co-opted more broadly and it is widely used and it, it can be uh, an unfair categorization of someone who's socially and occupationally very healthy. And that is critical because we we don't define a disorder unless there's social or occupational dysfunction. It doesn't matter what the symptoms are. I've had patients who are pleasantly hallucinating, so frankly psychotic, but doesn't affect their lives. So I don't give that person a diagnosis because there's not social or occupational dysfunction. Same with any anything on this, you know, any of the diverse symptoms of, of, of autism spectrum disorder. If someone has them, but they're successful socially and occupationally, we don't say that there's a disorder. But then you're right, the, the concept of the spectrum does become a, a useful, uh, you know, pigeonholing um, device, which is maybe not, not the best thing. <laughs> yeah, and the eye contact is an interesting one. Is an interesting one. Yeah. I'm torn on it. I'm torn about the usefulness of eye contact because people kind of make fun of it, but... Well, uh, let me just say one thing about eye contact and about life in general. Hmm. It's okay to be weird. <laughs> yes. But the but like some people when you have your eyes closed and there's that weird what is happening to this creature? Like you see a weird creature on the side of the road. It's interesting. Yeah. And you want to I mean the the weird stuff, I'm going to go back to Robin Williams with the that's the good stuff. Right? He has that whole speech about him and his wife and what he loves all the little peculiarities all the weird stuff and that like um let those flourish yes uh, let those like celebrate those in yourself and not in some kind of woke way but in some like very human way this is what makes us this is the weirdness yeah i i'm 100 percent on board with that i and, and i don't think you know people who are happy and who have people in their lives who, who are happy with them these are I think let let the weirdness flourish. Let the let the all the different ways members of the human family can be different. Let's see them all. That's one of our that's one of the joys of being alive is, is seeing all the ways we can be human. And I I think about it all the time. Why do we have all these ways of being human? Uh, and even within one individual, you go through phases of life where you express different sides of your way of being, which is also a pretty fun opportunity, right? You can go through phases where you're in one mode and phases when you're in another mode. And let that, you know, just let that let that flourish too. Let the ways that you can be you uh, vary as well. I think that's important for people to, to explore. And I should, like, as if you can address the, uh, the, uh, the internet, but I, I would like to sort of ask the internet, <laughs> <laughs> to celebrate the uh the the weirdness of people like that's uh it's it's the robin williams uh uh people call these imperfections but they're not that's the good stuff for any one individual person find the weird stuff and celebrate it as opposed to what the internet often does which is find the weird stuff and criticize it because when you criticize the weird stuff, you're creating conformity, which is another human thing. But that, that conformity creates a, a boring world. You want the weird. <laughs> you want the crazy. That's what fun is made of. That, that, that's the, uh, the foundation of humor and the, all the ways in which we deal with the, with, the, with the suffering in the world, with the injustices in the world is like, this like huge variety of weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. And that's what at the depth of psychiatry is like, you wanna uh, acknowledge the weird, celebrate the weird, like step around it to find the particular aspects of weird that are debilitating, like you said, they're somehow negatively affecting your ability to function in the world, as opposed to trying to, Shut it all down. That's right. 